Hey again, this is Michelle Belanger, and uh, this is going to be the third of my attempts at uh, little webisodes. Several of you had commented that you were having a hard time hearing on the last two about my first ghost. So I am using a different microphone, and we'll see if this fixes the issue. Now, I'm not certain that it will, and I do apologize if it does not, but I will continue as we go along with these to improve them to the best of my ability, but please keep in mind that I'm technologically not advanced. I've recently been dragged kicking and screaming into the 20th century, only to discover that it is now the 21st. You will notice that my location has changed. Uh, what you see behind me is part of my library. Uh, I have a collection of about 3,000 books on occult and paranormal topics. Many of them are rare. Uh, quite a number of them now are out of print. It's a collection that uh, lots of people have come to use. And actually Josh and Elfie of the Paranormal Research Society have had a chance to come down here and just sort of roll in the books. Uh, it's one of the things that got me working with the Paranormal Research Society, in fact, uh, kind of as a... Well, if they're the Scooby Gang from Buffy, I'm Giles. Very much happy, very, very happy in my books. So what I figured I would answer, I've got a lot of questions, and I've got to say I'm really thrilled with the response I've gotten for this. I didn't expect this to suddenly take off quite the way that it has, and I do appreciate everybody who's listening and watching and just kind of participating in this by sending me questions. Uh, the question that I'd like to answer, I've gotten a lot, but this one I think is very important to address. It was submitted by WolfEyes24 on Twitter, and she asks, when did I begin to stop doubting my abilities? Now, the thing is, is I still doubt them. Uh, now, when I'm presenting, you know, a walkthrough or something on Paranormal State, it might not sound like it. Now some of it is actually my, I'm not sure if that sounds crazy, gets edited out just for continuity because frankly I say it so many times that it would get really, really old. And when you've got 22 minutes of television that you're actually allowed to kind of uh, condense this entire experience into, me nattering on about the fact that, uh, well, it could be this and it could be this and I'm not quite sure, that's not going to help anybody. Now. I will say that my experiences with Paranormal State have significantly helped me have a lot more faith and confidence in my perceptions. It's not that I thought that I was inaccurate, but for the longest time, uh, most of the things that I was reading, they were familiar. I mean, people, friends, uh, the locations. Uh, if I did investigations or house cleanings here, they were mostly in Ohio, and if I was picking up historical stuff, well, quite frankly, I know a lot about the history of things around here. So I could never rule out the fact that maybe there was um, this stuff called cryptamnesia, and cryptamnesia is basically you learned something once, you forgot that you learned it, and later the information manifests. You don't know where it came from, and you assume that somehow you've obtained it through supernatural means, when really it's literally you've forgotten that you watched a show on the Discovery Channel that taught you all about it when you were five. Doubt, doubt is really important. Now, it can totally shoot you in the foot, and there's a level of doubt that is healthy, and a level of doubt that we need to strive to overcome if we're really going to be able to adequately convey our perceptions. The reason that a certain amount of doubt is healthy is psychic impressions are, are not fact. They should not be treated as fact. At best, they're soft facts. Uh, we get these impressions, but they are filtered through at least three different steps from the moment of raw perception to our ability to then express that perception to the rest of the world. And those three filters allow for a great deal of error. And it's perfectly natural, perfectly human error, but it's error that we need to be aware of. Now the very first level of filter that we have to account for is purely each person's raw ability to perceive. Think about it. Everybody has different levels of perception. Uh, if you are someone who identifies as psychic or even sensitive and you've talked with other people who also identify as psychic or sensitive, chances are you've already learned that everybody has different ways that they perceive. Their perceptions speak to them in different languages 
And quite frankly, not everybody has the same things that they tune into. Some people are a little bit more naturally attuned to emotions. Others are going to focus in on the, the, the physical impression, the image of the spirit. Some people won't pick up spirits at all, but they'll pick up something totally different. It doesn't make it any less valid that it's a different sort of perception. They're still getting information. So that first step, that first level through which things are filtered, is your very raw ability to perceive. The next step is your interpretation of that perception. All of these psychic abilities manifest to us in a way that is kind of outside of the realm of our five physical senses. And yet our brains are hardwired to perceive and to understand things from the five physical senses. So what we will end up doing is we'll start to interpret them as most like a certain sense. If you're a very visual person, chances are you will have your psychic perceptions manifest most like images, most like visual perception. If you're very auditory, it's going to be most like sound. Uh, I know people for whom it manifests more like scent or taste, or very kinesthetically, like senses, feelings, you know, hot, cold, prickly on their skin. And it becomes very difficult to always make that make a whole lot of sense. Uh, you have a lot of time and practice and patience and personal interpretation of your particular symbol set, your particular set of experiences that you have to devote yourself to understanding before you can really start to translate that with any accuracy. And then, and then you have the third filter, and that third filter is expressing it, articulating your perceptions. Think about that. Do we really have adequate language for most of these perceptions in the English language? I'm not sure we even have adequate language for most of these perceptions in any language. Uh, as it is, I mean, we're talking about energy, you know, I always talk about how this stuff is transmitted to me on energy, but energy is just a word that I've co-opted. It means so many different things. It can be kinetic energy that is, you know, locked in objects. It can be energy like electricity. And yet when I use the word energy in a psychic sense, I don't mean any of those things. I mean this sort of invisible thing that I pick up on that seems to sometimes behave like energy but not necessarily like radiation or electricity and yet sometimes it does. Sometimes it's picked up on EMF meters as if it were some sort of electromagnetic thing and then consistently it doesn't always show up like that. So, you know, I've co-opted this word energy. Uh, it's borrowed from ideas in other cultures in China, you know, qi, the vital force in uh, yoga, prana, breath, life, energy, this living force that permeates all things. But the language, well, quite frankly, much like we will use senses for which a perception is most like, we will use words for which it is most like. And often those words are unique to us, unique to our own symbol set, unique to our own experience. And interpreting what that really means, if you're not the person who has had the raw experience, the internal interpretation, and then the articulation, interpreting that is very difficult. It's how, on a fairly regular basis, you can have three, three psychics walk into a room all three of them have proven to be fairly accurate in consistent levels, and all three of them will pick up and report something in that room. And if you listen to specifically the words that they use, it might sound like they have three different impressions. One person will be going on about anger and, and harsh emotion and all of this, this you know, just, just hard, hard, horrible stuff, and somebody might just be talking about the color red. They just keep seeing red. They keep seeing red. And the third person might feel hot. Hot and a little closed in and overwhelmed and breathless. But if you compare without strictly and literally quantifying those anger, red, hot, if you think about the, the connotations, the associations we have with those, it all kind of lines up. So doubt is important so that you learn to be objective, that you always question, always measure, and never assume that you're always accurate.